know that our planet is surrounded by an atmosphere and we are held on here by the forces of gravity? Well, nature gives us a few clues. Even those of us with physical challenges learn to recognize the difference when an elevator falls, for instance, or our breath becomes labored at altitude. Take a moment now to bring your awareness to your own breath. And after Mr. Per Percival, it could be rather fr frenetic. But bring your awareness to your breath and feel the weight of your body as you are seated or standing where you are right now. Look down and imagine that your legs are now extended by one third. And it requires considerable effort to straighten them. Your arms, instead of falling by their sides, are rising up to your midline. Even looking down to witness these phenomena, you notice that your neck, your neck is extended beyond its natural reach. And if you were to, to raise it to where it felt natural, you would in fact find that your gaze would be cast upwards, your spine lengthened, and your jaw dropped. Imagine now that your limbs are compressed, your lungs are compressed, and with each respiration, with each inhalation and exhalation, you rise and fall. Now visually, this would reference all sorts of things that we see in nature. But audibly, it sounds like something from a distant galaxy far, far away. I'm talking about the Darth Vader syndrome. <sighs> yes, in your mind's eye, you have become a diver, an underwater explorer, and an avatar of the sea. Take a moment now to imagine what it would be like, what it would feel like, how you would move, what you would do and what you would explore how you would communicate and express yourself. Imagine the sights and sounds, the colors, the sensations against your body. Ask yourself, what would you do and who would you become? I'm in the business of creating new media underwater. I dive maybe four or five times a week to a depth of 12 meters for up to 150 minutes with each dive. I do bounce diving, which means I can ascend and descend up to 19 times in any one dive. I work in ver zero visibility, in a harbor, an ocean harbor, with water that is naturally stained by the tannins of the tea tree and button grass indigenous to a world, cultural, a world heritage cultural area in Tasmania. Yes, Michael, I'm one of those from the wilderness. It is here in that place. It's with that unique perspective that I can say what the world needs now is to develop an aquatic consciousness, to return to the life cycles and the natural rhythms of this planet so that the world itself can undergo some serious hydrotherapy. Now, with a background as a performance artist, one could say that I live and breathe a liquid reality. But it is an interesting perspective. The disciplines of diving of, and the body consciousness and the environment consciousness combined create some really interesting creative possibilities and a unique perspective on the state of our oceans and waterways. Also, the audience and human response to those aspects. I have a wish, and that is to develop virtual and real studio technologies and choreographies for artists to lead advanced human exploration underwater as one part of a survival strategy for our species. It's a bold statement, and this is something that began with my research into the field of aquabatics as a PhD student. Aquabatics is at the nexus of contemporary performance and commercial diving. Now, contemporary performance is not like theater. It's not like circus arts or film. We are not strictly entertainers. We do not play the role of someone else. We are ourselves, raw and vulnerable bef and essential before an audience. In all honesty, I'm completely immersed in my practice. I know what it means to be saturated 
and it is literally breathtaking. Aquabatics creates the possibility for us to understand the aquatic realm and our efforts within it. At the outset, aquabatics explores the potentials and freedom for expanding ourselves beyond our land-based dimensions. But like all human pretensions, I've learned a great deal from, my from facing failure in attempting these kinds of feats. Understanding the aquatic realm is as much about navigating through the technology and the environment as it is about connecting with yourself as a body in and of and for water. Learning to picture yourself and understand where you are placed in and how you behave within the aquatic realm. It is also about articulating the concept of the inner experience, that which is internalized and that which can be externalized to an audience. Part of the work has also included this aestheticization of care and of operation and protocol between the crews and the people who can make this happen. In a sense, aquabatics creates an image of a neo-aquatic human and with all of the delicate life balances that are required to sustain that type of life or living essence. By the end of 2005, I had exhibited a major retrospective of aquabatics, which included a body of uh, seven new works, which in some way began to articulate this type of experience and journey. As you can imagine, by working with underwater operations, I suddenly had this interest in looking at the parallels with space missions. I was looking at what the aquanaut goes through and the astronaut, and the very real parallels between human performance in a weightless environment and a neutral buoyancy environment. While some of my efforts might have been a little bit more poetic than practical, I was also able to make some significant te technological advances in the name of art. Included was a dual rebreather, a prototype that was established for used in a survival situation by two people, and uh, this is soon to be patented. As fortune would have it, I'm very privileged to be part of the League of New Worlds undersea or first undersea habitat expedition called Atlantica. Atlantica will see at three aquanauts living and breathing and working continuously from a, a custom-made facility called the Leviathan for 90 days, commencing on the 14th of July, 2011. The primary aims of this project are to investigate, to knowledge build, and to test the systems and requirements for a new generation of people to begin as in-water custodians of our ocean uh, oceans and waterways. Now there's a lot at stake. These aquanauts need to work on some very simple but long existing challenges, and that is to deal with working towards a zero waste culture and trying to work out how we can navigate the issue of carbon dioxide waste. We also need to learn some very important lessons about confined space and remote habitat living. So the mission has been planned. We're going to set it up environmental in water monitoring stations and set up the protocols and data transfer options that are going to be necessary for the vital education, outreach, and dissemination of results from this expedition. The location has been, been decided. It's more or less um, a region that has been identified and approved at the moment called Polaris B of the of Florida Keys in the United States waters. Construction has commenced on the uh, Leviathan habitat, but also on the support vessels that are going to be required for that, including a Dan Scott Taylor submarine, which will be used in water, and various surface vessels that will be supporting the expedition. This is a, an international crew. I'm very privileged to be a part of a, one of the most experienced underwater crews that have ever been combined for, a, for an undersea habitat mission. Um, uh, there are eight countries that are being represented. 
And it's also an incredibly dynamic and uh, interdisciplinary team with a, a focus, well, a strong contingency of artistic um, creators, which I'm very pleased to be a part of. So in my mind, I can imagine with this kind of caliber of crew, this type of collaboration resulting in something like Big Brother crossed with Discovery and So You Think You Can Dance Underwater. <laughs> it's going to be beautiful. I don't know how many people can say that they wet themselves every day at work. <laughs> but I do, and I enjoy it and love it. And this is an incredible, incredible opportunity to make use of this underwater studio uh, potential. And I personally will be looking at the choreographic potentials of, of this and working with the crews through the use of, or the creative use of technology, of entertainment, and design, sound familiar? <laughs> um, and with a particular emphasis on conducting important and vital communications and outreach. In fact, we're, se we're setting 50% of our on-air live time to linking up with those objectives. So much contemporary thought and critical thinking in the areas of space science, particularly in climate science, mitigates against or countermeasures aspects of the extreme environment. But my research faces those challenges as an adaptive strategy. We should not forget that we're an adaptive species and our planet is always changing, arguably at a rate far accelerated by a recent intervention. But independence is simply an illusion. And the paradox of interdependence is that we simultaneously constrain and empower each other. Collaboration, whether it between, be between art and science, between people and the environment, between one and many. We need good communication, we need good imagination, and we need to be able to come together to form a symbiosis a calculated and specific performance of the re really primal artistry and the basic forces of nature. Adaptation begins with understanding the human behavioral changes, physiological and psychological, and the effects on human expression, with its foundation in philosophical investigation, art is critical to that process. Please join with me in a breath of solidarity. Inhale and exhale and spread the word. Thank you. <laughs>